Welcome to Vermont Today. I'm Terry Geralman, your host, and my guest this month is Cassandra Geekus. Cassandra is running uh, for Lieutenant Governor of the State of Vermont as a, a Democratic uh, candidate and also a progressive on both uh, party lines. Uh, Cassandra, it's good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Terry. It's a pleasure. How's the uh, campaign going? Oh, it's going great. I, c I can hardly believe that we only have 39 days left. <laughs> There's a part of me that is a little relieved that it's, you know, we can see the, the home stretch and the other part of me um, is just knows we have a lot, of do, a lot more to do. So, um, you know, we're looking at really ramping up over the next four or five weeks and uh, continuing to crisscross the state seven days a week. And the encouragement and the support that I've been receiving across the state has, has been incredibly energizing. Would you like to tell our viewers uh, something about your background, uh, where you grew up and went to school? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, part of what I've been trying to do, because I've spent so much time working behind the scenes, is really introduce myself to Vermonters and why I'm here, you know, what my vision for Vermont is and, and how I hope to achieve that as Lieutenant Governor. So I've done a lot of reflecting over the past few months and um, for me, my desire to, to um, make a difference in the world or have an impact in the world started very young for me. I grew up um, in a big Greek and Italian family in Pennsylvania and my mother was actually born in Italy at right at the tail end of World War II and in pretty extreme poverty, so no shoes, no school books, very little food on the table. And she moved to this country in her mid-20s and she really, you know, for her, the United States was up on a pedestal. It was the quintessential American dream here. And when she moved here and married my father and started a family, I think it was very important to her to instill in us a sense of gratitude for just the basics that we had. I mean, we, we were a lower middle class family, but um, having a roof over our head and food on the table, um, you know, she would come home with all the groceries in her hands and be like, abondanza, and put them all out on the table. So we knew at a very young age that, that we were lucky to have what we had. And as I got older, I was just a voracious reader and was really drawn to policy and politics and I just couldn't from 12 or 13 I couldn't really make sense of of why I had these things and so many other people didn't and even in this country um, where where we have wealth and we have the means to make sure that everyone is doing okay um, so I knew fairly uh, young that this is what I that I wanted to uh, that I had a responsibility because I had some privilege growing up to give back um, and it started, you know, I've worked on a host of different issues from domestic violence and women's health to access to transportation, um, uh, federal food stamp policy, and most recently health care in the state house. And, you know, I started my work doing, uh, working one person at a time. And that, that is incredibly gratifying and it's really important work. But I realized that for me, policy is what I, it's what I was born to do and it's the, it's the place where we have the biggest opportunity because, you know, if lawmakers, you know, passing one law or making one decision in the state house can change the lives of thousands of Vermonters um, in, in, one, in one decision and that's what my focus is on and that's what I've spent really the past uh, eight years in Vermont doing, working on policy um, and trying to help uh, move the state forward and make those big picture decisions. So you've only been living in Vermont for eight years? Yes, I've been in, I moved to Vermont in 2004 and uh, I have to say, you know, we make lots of jokes about flatlanders <laughs> around the state and um, I I'm a flatlander too. Okay. Um, but growing up in Pennsylvania, um, you know, it was strip mall country. We didn't know our neighbors. Uh, we had to drive everywhere and um, and I think there was really something lacking there in the community. and. I moved to Vermont after visiting once a year before and I just knew that Vermont was where I wanted to be, at, that it was my home. Um, not only because, you know, walking around downtown, you knew your neighbors, there was place, a place for people to gather. Um, there was all this unique culture that I felt like uh, was really missing in where I grew up. Um, but also I had the sense that things are possible here that are just not possible anywhere else because of our values, because of, of the close-knit nature of our communities. We take care of each other. Um, 
and it's a small state, which I think allows us to uh, experiment with a lot to build consensus that, that you can't build in other places to have access to our decision makers. And when I look at healthcare, affordable childcare, renewable energy, these are all places that we can lead the country. So I'm, I'm proud to be a Vermonter. I'm proud to call Vermont home and I'm in it for the long haul and I feel like I have this unique appreciation <laughs> and you probably share it too for how special Vermont is because I grew up somewhere else and it makes me you know all the more determined to keep it keep what's special about it going and make it even stronger in the long term. You live in Burlington right? I live in Montpelier actually typically although for the campaign you know I've devoted my life to the campaign trail so I'm in Burlington for the campaign um, and then I hope to go back to Washington County, but uh, this is where my staff is. It's where the party headquarters are located. So uh, it's convenient to have the whole team together. I've been living in downtown Burlington for the past six years. Mm -hmm. And what you say about being a small city and being able mm -hmm. to walk to everything, that's, uh, that's the big advantage that I see mm -hmm. to, to living in Burlington. But Montpelier is sim similar. Yeah, Montpelier is. and I. Well, for me, I wanted to have a small, shorter commute. Once I started, you know, for the past two and a half years, I've been working in the state house, and I just did not want to do the 45-minute drive. Um, and I have two dogs, so when I'm working long hours, I, it's nice to be able to pop down the street in Montpelier to let them out or take them for a quick walk. Um, but I think, you know, it's funny now that I live in Montpelier, Burlington does seem like a city to me, <laughs> and there's this. Uh, you know, Montpelier's quiet by nine o'clock, like there's a community, but everyone, you know, uh, goes out a little earlier and goes home a little earlier than they do in Burlington. And, and I think the, the people who are there, it's less of a transient community. So I felt really welcomed by the Montpelier community and, um, you know, Burlington's a great place. I, I like visiting these days. Peter has two dogs too. Have you introduced your dogs to him? No, yet? I have not. Yeah. I did not even know he had two dogs. <laughs> it's tough to have them on the campaign trail. I remember two years ago, uh, I, I interviewed uh, uh, Peter before the election, mm -hmm. and um, I had to go over to his office, and he had the two dogs there. They're, they're relatively large dogs. Yeah. Yeah, we could use a, a play date with the dogs. I think they're getting pretty bored in the house. <laughs> but this will be your first uh, effort to uh, win elective office, right? Yes. Before this, you've been working with uh, VPIRG? Yes, most recently with VPIRG on healthcare policy in the State House. Um, and, you know, it's a question I get a lot about elected office. And I think that for the general public, you know, I was a surprise entry into the race. And, uh, and you know, lieutenant governor is an important position. It's an executive position in Vermont. You could become governor. Howard Dean did that. Yes, which is one of the reasons why I think that it's important that I'm, that voters have a real choice in November. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that when you look at, um, at the governor's track record, the issue, the, the ways in which he's moving us forward on health care, on renewable energy, you know, this is an agenda that Vermonters have endorsed. And he's a very popular governor. And it's important that the lieutenant governor, if called to that duty, will continue to keep Vermont on the right track on these issues and will continue to, to move forward based on the vision and values of Vermonters. And that's a promise that I can make without any ambiguity to, to Vermonters today, and my opponent cannot make that promise. Um, but I think, you know, so I was a surprise entry for a lot of people, but I think for people who know me well, it, it really wasn't that surprising because I'm the, I'm the type of person who um, has a clear vision for where where I want to go and really seeks out challenges and uh, you know I had been thinking about running for office for a while because you know, I've spent so much time on the ground doing the research you know seeing policy through the nuts and bolts from identifying the problem you know doing the research writing the policy lobbying in the state house testifying before committee um, you know, seeing the making sure the bill passes, and then overseeing the implementation of it. Um, that uh, I really have a, wi a wide breadth of experience in, in terms of actually how policy making works, both in the state house and on the ground. Um, and I didn't want to be on the sidelines anymore. When I look at an issue like health care, um, the decisions that we have to make in 2013 and 2014. I mean, these are the points in time where 
every other comprehensive reform effort has fallen short, either at the state level or the national level. And so in my mind, we need an incredible amount of courage, both on the part of our state leaders and on the part of Vermonters to continue to move forward. And, uh, and I was looking at the landscape and all of the liability on, on uh, health care reform is in the Senate and the Lieutenant Governor presides over the Senate. And you know, right now we have a Lieutenant Governor who does not support moving to a single payer health care system. And I see that as a problem. And you know, instead of just being a persuader on the sidelines, I wanted to step in and be a solution to the problem. And, uh, and that's something that you know, the leadership in the Democratic and Progressive Party really encouraged me to do because they've seen my track record um, and know that my message will resonate with Vermonters. I'm a candidate to represent uh, Chittenden County mm -hmm. in, the, in the state Senate. So if, if I'm elected mm -hmm. to the Senate, I, I intend to work, do everything I can to pass health care. Uh, I, I lived in, uh, in Montreal for two years mm -hmm. and I had the uh, Canadian uh, health care system. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's what we really what we need here mm -hmm. in Vermont. Um, I never had to wait in line, and the, I could choose my own doctor. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was absolutely wonderful in, in Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <coughs> it's, I mean, one of the most difficult things that we face is picking through the misinformation. You know, there's so much misinformation out there about what healthcare in Canada is like or what healthcare in Europe is like. And, you know, we've seen the new um, ads on TV. Uh, the anti-healthcare reform ads um, that are running in over the past couple weeks, and you know they're saying things like single payer will mean doctor shortages and long lines, and and there's actually a heart monitor that beeps and then goes flat, you know, and this is the kind of fear, unfounded fear that that uh, that opponents of reform are sparking in Vermonters, and it's it's an, it's the oldest trick in the book. We've seen it time and time again, and for some reason it's still easy for us to fall for it. So we have to be um, very vigilant and keep talking to Vermonters and keep, you know, keep the courage up because this is really just a factor of there being a lot of entrenched interests and a lot of money in, uh, in the health insurance system. And if, if Vermont successfully implements single payer, um, you know, the insurance companies don't care about Vermont, they care about the precedent that we're going to set for the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where we become a key battleground on health care reform. That's how it started up in Canada, a small mm -hmm. province, yep. uh, Saskatchewan started mm -hmm. it. Yep, so it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, I'm, and I'm committed to doing everything I can to help getting us there, and, and it sounds like you are too, and that's, we need more of that. What would you say is the most important issue uh, facing uh, Vermont now? Is it health care? I mean, healthcare is certainly at the top of my list. Um, I think what <coughs> you know, what we hear a lot from people, and I think the tone around the country is really about jobs and economic development. Um, jobs, I think, are at the top of everyone's list as a concern. You know, we have, and I know this, you know, firsthand. Um, you know, my parents are uh, have worked hard their whole life. My mom's a small business owner. My dad worked for the federal government, and they're looking at retirement and they don't know how they're going to make the numbers work. Um, you know, we have young people who are, have a lot of student loan debt. I have $60,000 myself um, and trying to figure out, you know, what their career path is going to be and whether they can stay in Vermont. I think there's a, a lot of anxiety and Vermont is doing really well in a lot of ways. But uh, I think, you know, some of the tone of what's happening around the country and the world um, has given families this sense of, are things going to keep getting better? You know, am I going to be able to retire comfortably? Is my child going to be able to pay back their loans and start a family or buy a home? And so that, I think, is why a lot of our conversations go back to jobs. Um, and that is, uh, uh, you know, a vibrant economy is something toward we're, that we're working toward in Vermont. And what I'm offering, which I think distinguishes me from my opponent, is a, is a clear path to get there. And that's where I think things like health care come in, affordable child care, um, access to, to capital for downtown businesses, um, uh, smart growth policies, all of these things so that we're building strong communities um, to support working families. And, uh, and that's a different approach than, than we typically hear from, from my opponent or his party. 
You said that you have uh, $60,000 in student debt now. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, you, you just finished a master's degree, right? I'm finishing it actually at the, at the end of this year. I'm hopeful that we're just dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the thesis paperwork. Is that at UVM? At UVM, yes, Community Development and Applied Economics. So I finished all, as, uh, when I was at UVM, I was a research fellow at the Transportation Research Center. Um, studying low-income mothers and access to transportation here in Vermont and uh, did some really great work there and really you know one of my goals while I was there was to uh, strengthen my understanding of economics and statistics because my heartstrings are pulled by all of these issues and you know I have a value system uh, in place that helps me make policy decisions but I want want to make sure the numbers work too that I'm I'm pragmatic in that sense as well um, and you know, was doing did that work and saw an opportunity to work for VPIRG and help move healthcare forward. Um, so about three quarters of the way through the <laughs> through the thesis work, I left to to work at VPIRG and have been sort of picking through it little by little over the past two years. So we'll be finishing up this year. I just got a master's degree from UVM uh, oh, last you? May uh, in business administration. Oh, that's great. Did you enjoy your time there? Yes, it took me three years to it's do it. Yeah. You know, when you're working professional and you're going part-time, it takes a while, but, uh, but the information was really valuable and the experience and the research I was able to do has given me, um, really opened my eyes to, to the issues that we face in the state on transportation and, and the impact it has on families that is typically invisible to a lot of us. Um, so that was, that was really important work for me. Um. In uh, connection with the cost of education uh, and uh, health care, mm -hmm. uh, most of the other countries where, uh, th which have uh, uh, national health insurance, mm -hmm. uh, they provide uh, subsidies for the medical school. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in, I lived in France for a while, and one of the principles of the French Revolution was that uh, education should be free for mm -hmm. everyone all the way through medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, if, we, if we could help our medical students at UVM yeah. and our other students, but especially the medical students, that would mean that they could graduate with a much less debt mm -hmm. and then they could uh, provide, they would encourage more students to go to medical school mm -hmm. and they could also provide services at a lower fee, yeah. which would uh, make it more affordable for everybody too. I completely agree. I think uh, expanding our loan forgiveness programs to keep young professionals working in Vermont after they finish school is, is really important and a high priority for me. And I think certainly he primary health care um, is a place where we need to do make those kind of investments. Um, you know, I also think we have to we have to think very seriously about the cost of college and really try to understand why the cost of universities are skyrocketing. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't. I want to make sure that if we're if we're helping with loan forgiveness programs or subsidizing school in some way, that the money is also being utilized responsibly at these universities. Um, so, but I think that the loan forgiveness programs are incredibly important, and 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 making sure that we have things like healthcare and livable wages when people get when students get out of school, because uh, you know for me I'm paying what like four hundred and fifty dollars a month for the next. 25 years or so, you know? Long. Yes, I mean, I'm just uh, rounding that in my head right now, but that, that's, you know, I'm paying 450 a month, and it's tough to get by on that. Um, and for a lot of people, I mean, for me, that puts my first home out of reach for a very long time. I mean, and, and I think this gets back to my philosophy on the role of government, which, again, I think is very different than my opponents, um, in that I, you know, I don't see government as the goal of government is to be run like a business. To me, government is about, uh, you know, Vermonters pooling resources to make investments in our communities that none of us could make on our own. And we need to make sure that those investments are made uh, deliberately with planning, that they're efficient, but they're for the common good, right? It's not just for the sake of profit or for the sake of employing people. And so. Um, we're all paying taxes, and it seems to me that we think about that I would put healthcare and education in the same category as, as I would put roads and bridges and our public transportation system and our public schools. And politicians have a tendency, especially 
here in Vermont with two-year election cycles to think in two-year increments. And the conversation in this country since what, the 80s has really separated the discussion of taxes and services. And so even talking about revenues or taxes is, you know, strikes fear into the heart of politicians. And so, but what it does is it really cuts off the conversation. It doesn't allow us to have long-term planning conversations um, in, in, in the state or in this country. And, you know, I, if I look at something like healthcare affordable, or let's talk about affordable childcare. If we were to make some investments to help make childcare affordable, or we were to uh, have a loan forgiveness program for medical students, that may take raising some revenue now, but the long-term payoff, it, I mean, uh, comes back four or five-fold, you know, when we have um, young children that are being, uh, that are getting healthy nutrition, edu being well-educated in early childhood programs, getting a fresh start before they get to, to elementary school. We have, you know, a family that can now go to work, could start their own business because, you know, uh, Right now, the numbers don't work for them, but you make childcare affordable, and it makes sense for them to go to work or for them to expand their business. So all of those ripple effects, we need to count in, in, our, in our planning and funding decisions, and I don't think we do enough of that now, and it's something that, um, you know, it's a philosophy that I, I really uh, want to bring to the Office of Lieutenant Governor and to all the work that I do in Vermont uh, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, you know. I'm here, I'm in it for the long haul. The big philosophical difference uh, in education between America and most of the rest of mm -hmm. the, uh, the world is that uh, in America, uh, access to education, higher education, is mm -hmm. based upon how much money your family has. Yep. Whereas in, in other countries, in Europe and in Canada, it's based upon uh, your scholastic aptitude mm -hmm. test and, and your ability to benefit from the education. Mm -hmm. um, I I just recently, uh, the Canadian government, or the uh, uh, government in Quebec, uh, changed because of on the educational issue uh, they tried to double tuition for mm -hmm. their students and so uh, the uh, 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 Liberal Party was defeated and now the Party mm -hmm. Quebecois is back in uh, in Quebec and they um, cut the tuition back to where it was but uh, even doubled uh, the, I think the original was about two thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. and doubled it came out to be four thousand and if you compare that with UVM uh, it's almost nothing. Yeah. Um, and that's not uh, loan forgiveness. That's mm -hmm. just uh, the basic cost of tuition. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm inclined, as a, as a progressive and a socialist, I'm inclined to, to uh, go by the principle of the French Revolution that education should be free mm -hmm. for everybody that's qualified. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, uh, uh, I would vote in the Senate to, uh, to uh, subsidize completely the medical education. Mm -hmm. so that the students could come out without any debt at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I uh, the MBA from UVM, mm -hmm. uh, U, uh, UVM gave me free tuition, mm -hmm. uh, and that was my third degree. Uh, the first degree was electrical engineering, mm -hmm. and uh, I paid for that by, uh, from the co-op program mm -hmm. at Northeastern. And the second degree was a uh, law degree from Fordham in New York, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I paid for that out of my earnings. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I never took out a debt. I don't think students should be expected to, mm -hmm. to go into debt. Yeah, and I think as a, as a 17, 16 year old, you have no idea what that even means. You know, you sign your life away mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and don't understand it fully, which is a huge problem. Um, but the th I don't know, the point I want to make uh, in all of this is that nothing is, f is free. So even if we choose to subsidize education or we choose to subsidize health care out of taxpayer dollars, we're still all making that investment. And it's we're making a financial investment in, in our children's future, which is extremely important. Um, but I think, I think we get trapped into this dialogue sometimes um, about we shouldn't be giving things away to people. And it's like, it's not about that. It's about a smarter way to pay for it. And do we want an individual student drowning in debt for the next 30 years? Um, or do we want to pool our resources and and really uh, and fund these systems in an efficient and effective way so that that student can can focus on learning instead of the debt that they're drowning in um, and focus on their careers and what they want to do instead of the debt that they're drowning in and um, and that kind of a shift is going to be big 
in this in this country and you know I see it as I see healthcare in that I mean you can see we're sort of trying to turn the ship and it's very challenging um, but what we need to do that work and um, and again you know the university system I mean it's big business people are making a lot of money off of it so it's, it becomes very difficult for for the the public voice or public advocates to make a difference unless leaders are really, you know, our elected officials are really willing to stand up and, and take a stand against it. Um, but I think that there's a lot that we can do in the meantime. You know, I think, uh, again, going back to some of the loan forgiveness programs, I think, uh, you know, recognizing that not every student wants or needs to go to college, and there's a lot of technical training um, and good work that, that can be done. Um, and so making sure that in our high schools we have strong vocational programs, job training programs, trade training programs. I think uh, I was talking to some folks in Bennington about the great work that they're doing there around this. And making sure that, that our community colleges are strong in Vermont. Um, you know, they're, they're good places for people to learn. And I actually, when I was in Pennsylvania, my senior year of high school, I went to community college, Harrisburg Area Community College, uh, instead of, of sticking in, in high school. And that was a fantastic experience. It was a great bridge to college. Um, it was a different level and approach to learning. And it was, a, it was really a great school. And so um, I think programs like that are really important. And you know, one of the best things that we can do is when kids are in high school or, or junior high is take the time to give them the attention they deserve and talk to them about what it is that they love to do, what they, wanna, what they want their contribution to the world to be instead of, uh, instead of pushing them all in this funnel to, uh, to the best colleges, the most expensive colleges. I think you know, there's a cultural shift that needs to happen as well in, in our country. I was at a reception for uh, Bernie Sanders last night in, uh, in Shelburne. Oh, I'm sorry that I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and he talked about uh, the distribution of wealth in America. Mm -hmm. And 1% mm -hmm. of the population has something like 40% of the wealth, and 60% uh, of the population uh, has uh, the other 40. So 1% uh, of the population has as much money as 60%. And the income is distributed similarly. Uh, I did a show with Chris Pearson mm -hmm. last year, and we had a, a graph showing the income distribution. Um, the, um, so Bernie's conclusion was that uh, we're moving, or, or perhaps we already are, an oligarchy mm -hmm. rather than, a, a, I guess you would call it a, a plutocratic oligarchy, uh, government by and for the rich, mm -hmm. and uh, which effectively means that we're engaged in a class warfare. Uh, but it's not class warfare of the poor against the rich, it's class warfare of the rich against the poor. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, well, uh, nothing's free, uh, uh, and uh, we have to pay for it, but who's pay, uh, who needs to pay for it? It's the people, that 1% that's stolen all our money. Well, I definitely believe in progressive taxation. Um, you know, I think that, and I, and I think we should capital gains, investment income, I would really like to see that taxed uh, at a level that's much closer to, <laughs> to income taxes. I mean, um, you know, I always think about, you know, these people uh, who are making millions and millions of dollars a year. Um, I have no doubt that they're, in most cases, they're working really hard. Um, but do I think they're working harder than uh, a single mom with two kids who's waitressing 60 hours a week? No, I think they're both, you know, I think that mom is blood, sweat, and tears um, and working as hard as she can to make ends meet. Um, you know, and, and any CEO who's making millions of dollars is making that money off the backs of people making seven or eight dollars an hour. So to me, it's about fundamental fairness. I mean, it's, it's not about government redistribution or any of these things. It's about it's about uh, work and fair pay. Um, and I think there has to be an acknowledgement uh, uh, among people who are making money at the top of that, of that ladder, <laughs> you know, uh, CEOs of international companies understanding that, that there's people who are working for minimum wage and, and that's, where they're, that's how they are able to make as much money as they do. Um, and so uh, it is about returning fairness to our taxation system. 
And that's why when I look at things like, I mean, when you look at what's really holding working families back, again, um, it's things like affordable childcare, healthcare, um, uh, access to capital for their businesses, home ownership, the ability to put a down payment on a house, um, and these things, saving for retirement, you know? And this is, some of these things we should be using our shared taxpayer dollars for. And, uh, and I do believe in progressive taxation. So, I mean, all of us are paying some taxes at some point in our life, the vast majority of us anyway. Um, but like, if, you know, we go back to the Mitt Romney comments about income taxes. Well, you know, there are a lot of people paying income taxes, payroll taxes, sales taxes. We're all paying into the system. Um, but, uh, but there's a, a pretty big percentage of people that are not paying their fair share. And we need to look up <laughs> to, to find those people. And, um, and that's why it takes, I think, a review of the tax code uh, to make sure that it's fair. Um, but before we do that in Vermont, what is it? The, the first conversation I want to have is what do we want Vermont to look like in 5 or 10 or 15 years? And if we want it to be a place where families can flourish, then we need to put our list of five things together that we need to tackle and we need to invest in. And like, a, you know, go back to healthcare, education, affordable childcare. We need to decide together that that's our shared list of priorities. And then we need to go to the tax code and look at the fairest ways to pay for those things. Um, and again, I think we, what's typically happens and what, what I think my opponent brings to the table is a conversation, the conversation is backwards. It's, here's how much money we have this year, what do we have to cut? That's, that's not the way we need to We should start off with right what do we need, and then how much money do we need to raise. Exactly. And it's difficult to do that year to year, but I have to say it's one of the, one of the big opportunities I think we have in the office of Lieutenant Governor. So, uh, you know, I guess I should take a minute or two to just talk about what Lieutenant Governor does mm -hmm. in Vermont. Um, it's, so it's a conversation I have a lot on the campaign trail. Cause, you um, chair the Senate, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I don't think we've seen a whole lot out of the office over the past four years in particular, but the Lieutenant Governor during the legislative session presides over the Senate, um, make sure that bills get their fair shake on the Senate floor, helps decide who goes on what committee, who chairs committees on the Senate, in addition to a, a lot of behind the scenes negotiation, um, and breaks a tie vote if need be on the Senate floor. And tie votes typically tend to be uh, revolve around controversial issues. And uh, I was reminded of a story actually, I was endorsed by Planned Parenthood Action Fund last week. and was reminded of, of Governor Keenan when she was Lieutenant Governor, broke the tie vote on Planned Parenthood funding. Um, so that tie vote is, is it's a really important role. Um, and we've also talked about uh, the Lieutenant Governor steps in if need be for the governor. But the third piece for me is really what happens that other six months out of the year. For me, this is a full-time taxpayer funded position. Um, and you know, I will put as I will work as hard as Lieutenant Governor as I have on all the work that I've done, um, and I'm working on the campaign trail. I mean, it's a full-time job for me, and I think that um, our legislature, the legislative session is short, and we have citizen legislators, which I think is an incredible asset. Um, but it does make it difficult to have these big picture planning conversations or move significant. Uh, legislation forward um, during that short period of time. So just like we did, I think the way we approached healthcare, the governor approached healthcare was right on in that we, we sought out help in developing the roadmap and looking best at best practices around, around the world and the country um, and did a lot of the legwork and the stakeholder input ahead of time, which is really what made it possible to pass uh, the, the first landmark piece of legislation in, this, in the state house. Um, in what 2010 now, um, mm -hmm. so that's what I want to do the other six months out of the year in the office of lieutenant governor um, to tackle some of these issues that we have not been able to tackle yet. And so, first on my list, because I hear about it on the campaign trail so much, and it is a jobs issue, is early childhood education, affordable childcare. Um, so my vision is, as soon as the legislative session is over, um, we use the little bit of resources that we have in that office. Uh, budget to look at models in other states that are working. 
We bring stakeholders to the table, so it's providers, it's state leaders, it's family members, um, to talk, really talk through the challenges and opportunities and, and build a roadmap together, a policy roadmap, um, working in concert with the governor and other state leaders so that when we start the session in January of, of 2014, there's a, a roadmap and a lot of the consensus has been built ahead of time and that's what's gonna allow us to move forward uh, in a meaningful way on some of these issues. And uh, one of the things I'm most excited about uh, uh, about uh, the Office of Lieutenant Governor is that opportunity. When Howard Dean was uh, Lieutenant mm -hmm. Governor, he uh, practiced uh, medicine mm -hmm. full time. It's um, incredible. <laughs> and he did a lot of, he actually did some good stuff in that office. I mean, if you look at uh, Howard Dean, uh, Madeline Keenan, Doug Racine, I mean, they, they utilized that office. Um, in a pretty significant way, much more significantly than we've seen in the past. Uh, uh, two folks who have held that office, held that office. But you're going to be a full-time lieutenant I governor. Am. You're not going to have another job. Nope. So we'll get a lot more for our money. <laughs> I, I think you will. It would probably surprise most people. Um, but that's you know this is this is my singular focus. This is what I am here to do. Um, and, and I have a very strong track record of not only pulling people together, working across party lines um, to find meaningful solutions and, and, and move to action. Um, and I think that you know, bringing those skills and that vision and that determination to the Office of Lieutenant Governor will, it's, it's a new day dawning <laughs> here in Vermont. And, and with the Lieutenant Governor that's working in concert with the Governor with, uh, with leadership in the House and Senate, I mean, we can accomplish a lot. Um, and, and it's my role to help be a leader and to help be a part of that. You mentioned working families a number mm -hmm. of times. Uh, do you have the support of the Working Families Party? Um, not yet, actually. Um, we've been, our endorsements are just coming in right now. Uh, so we have, I guess we, so we have the support of the Progressive and Democratic Party. We were just uh, as endorsed by Planned Parenthood Action Fund, by AFL-CIO, by VSEA. Um, so over the ne over the coming few weeks, we're in the process of reaching out to a whole lot of uh, uh, other groups, including the Working Families Party, as they make their decisions on their endorsements. Um, I was surprised to notice that Peter has the uh, Working Families Party. Uh, yeah, well, he's made. Com I mean, his commitments to healthcare and to early childhood education are strong, um, mm -hmm. and and. You know, I would expect uh, and I'm hopeful that, that the Working Families Party will endorse my candidacy as well. Their, their philosophy is very close to the Progressive Party, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I, I worked with them in New York. Mm -hmm. I, I lived in New York. Yeah. Uh, another issue is housing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a big housing shortage in mm -hmm. Vermont. W what do you think we should do for, um, to alleviate the housing s shortage? Well, I think we need to continue to invest in uh, the programs across the state that help Vermonters buy their first homes, help, uh, help link them to affordable housing. So some of the housing conservation trust funds and um, the, th the work that the Vermont Land Trust is doing, you know, th those sort of groups I think we need to continue to support. Um, and, uh, and I think that we need to as we approach downtown development, I mean, it's something that was that I thought about it a lot um, during my work at at the Transportation Research Center. Is what we're experiencing now, which is fantastic in a lot of ways, is a renaissance of downtown living. And you know, as gas prices go up, and as people um, remember what it is that they appreciate about living in a town center and seeing their neighbors and, and having everything they need in one place instead of living out in the suburbs as we saw for a long time uh, across the country. Um, our, we have this revitalization going on of our downtowns, but it has some impacts that if we're not careful can really price uh, a lot of lower moderate income Vermonters out of those, of those areas. Um, and you know there was a time when uh, when people of low incomes would live in town centers or city centers, and you know even though they didn't have a car, they could get everywhere they needed to go. 
But I think part of what we're seeing now is a lot of low-income Vermonters or moderate-income Vermonters even being pushed way out into rural areas of the suburbs. So you, but you combine that with the price of gas or not having access to transportation, it becomes a real problem. Um, so again, it comes back to our development policies and you know, smart growth principles and mixed income, mixed use housing, I think is really important. Um, and so I, you know, as towns are, are planning new housing units or developing them, I think it's really important that they're appropriate for mixed, I mixed income so that we, we don't shut out people working families uh, from our downtowns. Um, Before I moved downtown Burlington, mm -hmm. I used to put 12,000 miles a year on my car. And uh, since I've been living in the center of Burlington, I, mm -hmm. I put 4,000. So that makes a big difference on, uh, in gasoline. And it's true. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. And for families, you know, I mean, some of the stories that I heard from from low-income mothers who, you know, were choosing between putting food on the table or gas in the car. Um, and you're going to put gas in the car because you have to get to work. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these other ramifications of this budget squeeze that we don't normally realize or think about are really invisible to a lot of people. So affordable housing in Vermont is, is absolutely key. Um, and it's also time that we take a look at our property tax structure and, and, and uh, look at at what people are paying and see if there's there's ways to bring some relief to, to some folks who are struggling with property taxes. You said that you had worked on the food stamp program mm -hmm. in the past and uh, another program for uh, low-income uh, uh, people is the uh, the HUD housing program mm -hmm. and th there are vouchers which now require a four-year wait to get mm -hmm. a housing voucher even though someone needs uh, is economically in need of a voucher, yeah. they have to wait four years, in mm -hmm. which time maybe they are homeless. And uh, then for the, uh, the state has the housing, which there's a two-year wait, I mm -hmm. think, uh, for those units. So uh, from my point of view, I think that program is the, the most uh, pressing need. The, the, the higher income housing, uh, the people have money and they can incentivize uh, builders to provide mm -hmm. the housing. but. There's really nothing these people that we're waiting for the vouchers can do, except yeah. be homeless and maybe starve to death. Uh, so I, I, I have a, a, an idea about how uh, the state could uh, solve that problem. Hmm. Uh, we could issue a bond, uh, and uh, with the uh, revenue from the bond, we could build, uh, the state could uh, build uh, large apartment houses in Burlington. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I live in a 10-story building, I think that's ideal. Uh, and the state could own it and operate it and rent it out to uh, the uh, the voucher uh, people, and this would uh, this would provide housing for people who need it. It would also provide jobs for people who need jobs mm -hmm. in building the, the structures, and um, the the rents uh, the um, uh, the federal government pays uh, on the, the HUD uh, vouchers, and th those rents could be used to uh, pay off the interest on the bond. So it would be a, a no-cost uh, uh, proposition for the taxpayer. Uh, what yeah. would you think about that? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would definitely have to do some more thinking about it. Um, there's a couple things. One is I agree that the fact that there's waiting lists is a huge problem. Um, and and we're in a crunch. I mean, we're going to continue to have some of this crunch, experience these challenges with the federal government as, as there's more of a budget squeeze <laughs> at the federal level. Um, and that's going to mean tough choices and investments on the part of Vermonters uh, to make sure that we're still all moving forward and that our families are doing okay. Um, but I think any of that work has to go hand in hand with getting to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem, it, goes back to livable wages, it goes back to the cost of health care, it goes back to the cost of child care, and I know I sound like a broken record on those things, but, um, but what's most important is that we make investments and create uh, situations, job opportunities in Vermont where those families can, uh, can rise up out of where they are, the challenges they face, and have the opportunity for prosperity, have the opportunity to buy a home and those sort of things. Um, and so I don't want to forget about tackling the root problem of the issue. 
you know, the other thing that comes up a lot is um, we have a, a big problem with, with benefit cliffs in the state. And so um, if you compare Vermont to the rest of the country, <clears throat> even though we have uh, waiting lists for things like housing, we have good safety net programs for people who are at the lowest incomes. What we don't do, what we don't uh, have it invested in is, is the transition period for people. So if you are, let's say, a single mom with two children, um, the cost of, you know, if you're making the median income in Vermont as a single mom with two children is $25,000 a year, which I don't, it's a, I cannot even understand how someone, a mother with two kids could make it ends meet here in Vermont on that kind of income. The cost of childcare is 60% of her salary. Now, if I'm that single mother, this is just basic math. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense for me to go to work, go back to school, um, transition off, you know, any any programs. Because if you go back to work and start making, you know, eight or nine dollars an hour, suddenly you don't qualify for affordable housing. You don't qualify for VHAP. You don't qualify for for childcare subsidies. And that, in and of itself, is a problem. Um, and so we need to look at things like that, I think, as well. Um, and and the third thing I would say on this is community is very important and I get partly is because of where I grew up but I get nervous about uh, about projects or buildings that segregate in, in people by income and I think that it that feeds into some of the negative perceptions that we have in this country or in this state about people who are going through hard times not only that, but people who are going through hard times need role models and support networks around them for people, who, among people who are doing okay. And those, you know, I hear it all, every day on the campaign trail. You know, why does this person down the street have a benefit and I don't? You know, they don't deserve it, they're not working, they're too lazy. Or what about the, the mom on food stamps that goes to the store and buy chips? I mean, these are just, fundamental misunderstandings and judgments that we're making of our of our fellow community members that you know are frankly I think hurtful to our entire society and hurtful to Vermont and so the more that we can build inclusive uh, communities the better and so what I really like to see is mixed income housing mixed use housing so that you know on a block um, or even in an apartment complex. You have people of all different incomes there. And it's that kind of, of thing that's not only going to make our community stronger, that it's going to help build understanding between people who come from different backgrounds or in different circumstances. Um, and I just think that's really important because life is hard enough as it is and everyone goes through tough times. And what we really need is compassion and empathy and respect from each other. Um, and if we separate ourselves by gates and walls and buildings, we're never, you know, we're not going to build that. My idea of using a bond issue for mm -hmm. the state to uh, build apartment houses and then uh, uh, rent to people with the, uh, mm -hmm. the vouchers, the HUD vouchers, that would allow for a mixed community, like mm -hmm. you, you say, because the, um, the uh, apartments, uh, the HUD vouchers provide something like $800 mm -hmm. a month. And eight hundred dollar a month apartments are, are reasonably mm -hmm. good apartments. So people that are working could rent them uh, and pay the the rent, and then you would have some people that would have the vouchers, and they could come in. And if uh, if we had enough buildings, mm -hmm. uh, it would be all mixed up. And um, yeah, which I think is great. You know that kind of a, that kind of uh, project I think is really intriguing and worth figuring out where we can do that more of yeah. that because that the mixed income. Uh, housing and the voucher programs are really important. But you said there's a, a safety net uh, for the people that say are waiting four years for a voucher. Uh, what is the safety net for them? Oh, I, when I speak about safety nets, I mean, um, look, we're failing a lot of people in this country. So, you know, I, no bones about it. I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that we're doing enough. Um, but what I am saying is that if you you know, in Vermont, for instance, if you look at Medicaid eligibility in Vermont, um, you know, if we have Dr. Dinosaur up to 300% of the poverty line, if you look at West Virginia, I believe it's West Virginia, although I have to double check my stats, 
say you're eligible for Medicaid up to 33% of the poverty level. 33%. So if you're making, you know, the poverty line is what, like $9,000 or $10,000 a year for one person. If you make more than a couple thousand dollars a year, you don't get Medicaid. You have no access to the health care programs. So when I put Vermont on a, on a spectrum with the rest of the country here, you know, we look at things like um, BHAP and Dr. Dinosaur. Um, we look at some of our child care subsidy programs, our uh, food stamp or SNAP program eligibility. Um, there are a lot of safety nets in place that aren't in place other in other states. And so, uh, you know, we have to continue to invest in these programs where we're falling short. But we also have to uh, have to tackle the big picture because the reality of what we're facing right now is that more and more people, more and more Vermonters, are going to need and qualify for uh, for housing vouchers or for low-income housing. And at some point, we have to um, we have to help people also get back on their feet and transition out of that, and help them with job skills and job training, um, because. we want people to do well and to be successful. And so um, I guess what I'm saying is that I want, not only do we have to invest in those programs when people are, are, are facing difficulty, but we have to help them transition um, you know, to, to prosperity, to strong employment, to strong jobs, so that they can move out of that as well, which I think is, it's not only good for the Vermont's economy, it's not only good for our tax base and for that family, but it's a, you know, it's a big part of empowerment and feeling, feeling good about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. That safety net, though, for the people waiting on vouchers, mm -hmm. that's quite inadequate, I think. I agree. In, in Burlington, we have people that are living I every little area of woods. They, they live outdoors mm -hmm. in tents and sleeping bags. Some people, I know one woman was sleeping on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and they, even in the wintertime they, they do this. With the, they have the Eskimo sleeping bags, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a, a near Hannaford uh, in uh, South Burlington, there was a, a camp, an encampment in a mm -hmm. swamp, yeah. and they were surrounded by a swamp, and they had the tents set up there, and they were living there. Um, and you talk about Dr. Dinosaur and the health system, but if, uh, if somebody breaks their arm or has a health problem mm -hmm. and they have to go back in the swamp and, mm -hmm. and sleep on the ground in the winter, um, the, the health care isn't going to do them much good. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you 100% in, in saying that we need to invest in those programs. Housing is incredibly important. And, you know, not only are people living out and outside, <laughs> I mean, we have whole families living in shelters, we have people sleeping on couches, um, you know, in, in houses that aren't adequate for their families. I mean, the housing issue fundamentally has to be addressed, and vouchers, investing in the voucher system is one part of it. Mm -hmm. Another uh, related issue to health care is uh, a death with dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a bill coming up uh, this in this next legislative session. Uh, how do you feel about uh, d death with dignity? I'm absolutely a supporter of death with dignity. Um, I think this is this is a fundamental issue of, of choice for Vermonters um, and, and an option that people should have. I mean, we're talking about, about individuals who are terminally ill and have been um, identified you know, so, uh, by multiple doctors as having six months or less to live. And what this is really about is, is that individual I mean, there's no uh, ambiguity in, in what's happening. <laughs> They're facing their death, which is very difficult. And, and it's important that they feel empowered to, to have control over the time and place and, um, and situation of, that, of their particular passing. So it's a fundamental patient rights and choice issue for me. Um, and uh, looking at what happened in the legislature last year, I mean, we've this is a bill that is incredibly popular. I think 74% of Vermonters support this legislation. Um, that it's really been thwarted several times, including this past year. Um, and the lieutenant governor played a big role in in sending that bill to 
Senate Judiciary, which effectively you know killed it for the legislative session. Um, uh, sent it to this com a committee that it hadn't been before. It's a health care bill. Um, and so it, it highlights for me again the important role that the lieutenant governor plays in make or breaking some of this controversial legislation. And it's my feeling that uh, a bill like this that has such public support, that has, has leadership in the House and Senate you know, wanting to move it forward, should get its fair day on the Senate floor. And if the votes aren't there, the votes aren't there. But um, no one should be holding up that discussion. Um, and that's our responsibility as elected officials, and it's my responsibility to make sure that happens as lieutenant governor. Um, but, you know, all that being said, I'm very supportive of Death with Dignity. So if you had been there last year, mm -hmm. you would not have sent it to the Judiciary Committee, and that would, uh, would that, uh, then it would have passed, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, I would have, uh, would have fought from the get-go to help have that to help just avoid all of the procedural hurdles and make sure that bill could come to the floor and be discussed on its own merits um, from the healthcare committee. That's what's, I think that's what needed to happen. And, uh, and again, this bill, you know, I think, um, I think back to my grandmother. I mean, this is a bill that hits home for me. So my grandmother um, had dementia, Alzheimer's disease, so she actually would not have qualified for this legislation. That's really important for people to know is death with dignity we're not talking about people with disabilities. We're not talking about people with mental impairments. We're talking about people who are physically unwell, you know, in their last six months of life, but mentally well. They have and to be able to make a choice, a exactly, conscious choice. Exactly, yeah. and uh, so there's a lot of safeguards in place. But I look at, um, at how my grandmother died, and she was in a nursing home, um, and she had been there for a while, and she was getting sicker and sicker, and, uh, and they couldn't feed her anymore because she was like aspirating her food. It was going into her lungs and giving her pneumonia. Um, and the doctor said, you know, let's see if we can put a feeding tube in her and decided that she was too ill to do, to do that. At that point in time, I mean, she was in and out of consciousness, but not really there mentally. Um, we couldn't, and the nursing home couldn't, give her enough morphine to send her on her way. Although in Vermont, thankfully, you can do that. Um, all we could do was withdraw food and water. So, you know, at, I was 21, I think, sat by her bedside for a week and a half as she starved to death and gasped uh, through the last week and a half of her life. And there's nothing dignified or compassionate about that to me. We all knew in that room exactly what the outcome of this was going to be. And um, this is about fundamental comfort and, and respect and compassion for for other human beings, for our family members. Um, and, and again, I mean, she in particular would not have been eligible for this law, just like I think you know, my opponent talks about his, his father, who's a veteran, who would not have been eligible for this law. But it does bring up a very important conversation um, about, about death, this issue that we try to ignore so, you know, as much as possible until the last second. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big part of our culture, and I think we need to shift that. And, and when we talk about health care, death doesn't need to be a failure. It doesn't need to be a scary thing because it's an end that we're all going to meet. And so making sure that, that patients have as much control over that process as possible, that family members are educated. I mean, that's a big part of where our health care system is, has to go. Um, and death with dignity is, is one piece of the puzzle. It's something that we could do um, uh, that would really help bring comfort to people who who are terminally ill and facing a, a painful death that they feel that they don't have control over. Um, and, and the other thing I'll just say about this is we're not reinventing the wheel. I mean, there's at least th you know, three other states that have this, this law. Oregon, and Washington, and Montana, and Montana has, uh, yeah. but it's a judiciary uh, yeah. enactment. Um, that, you know, the fear or, you know, the horror stories, I mean, we're not, we're not seeing that come out of those places at all. It's yeah. not it's not impacting suicide rates, it's not sending the wrong message. And we're talking about a very small segment of the population that deserves our respect and 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 it, it's very much the same discussion we could have about choice, reproductive choice. I mean, these are people's bodies and they should have they should have a a say in how they bring life into the world and how they leave this world. 
I'm a strong uh, supporter of death with dignity mm -hmm. too. I used to think that uh, with morphine and uh, the painkillers, uh, no one would have to uh, mm -hmm. actually be in much pain, even at the end. But uh, recently, uh, I, I've, I've known people who uh, have had uh, have died of cancer, and it turns out that the uh, the uh, morphine and the painkillers don't work mm -hmm. uh, at the end mm -hmm. stages, and so the the pain becomes very severe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest argument uh, mm -hmm. in favor of death with dignity, because we don't want to torture our, our our older family members, and we know that the, if they we know that they're going to die, why should they be forced to suffer intense pain uh, before they die? Yeah, I agree, and uh, and I think that's part of why we're in a good way seeing growth of palliative care and hospice care too, because that philosophy is hopefully shifting a little bit. Um, but uh, I had a conversation yesterday with some of the the ad advocates around this bill, and the thing that struck me the most. Um, just sealed the deal for me in this argument is um, Vermont has doctors right now if a patient is unconscious and they feel they're uncomfortable and they're um, they're dying doctors can uh, sedate them to the point where it's basically pushing them on their way with morphine so the physician can make that decision for a patient or a family can help make that decision for a patient when they are unconscious but the, the patient, the person who's dying, when they are conscious and they're mentally aware, ha cannot make that decision for themselves. And that, that makes no sense to me. So we have, we're giving a power to a doctor and family members that we're not giving to an individual, and that's, that's just not right. It's also an unreliable system because mm -hmm. it depends on the doctors, what doctor you happen to get. Mm -hmm. And uh, doctors are uh, often intimidated too because uh, they can be charged with uh, mm -hmm. dispensing, uh, causing uh, people to become addicted and uh, dispensing controlled substances. Mm -hmm. And so some doctors are afraid to, um, if they're afraid to prescribe enough uh, painkiller, then mm -hmm. you, uh, you end up in pain. Yep. And it's always up to, I mean, this is also, I mean, death with dignity, this is an option. It's not, uh, you know, no, a doctor that doesn't feel comfortable with this doesn't have to do it. You know, uh, a patient that doesn't want to choose this option should not choose this option. What we really do is giving people options mm -hmm. and making sure that the appropriate safeguards are in place. Um, and that comes back to, you know, the mental health review and the certification by multiple doctors of, of the, the terminal illness and things like that. If I'm elected to the Senate, I will try to push that bill mm -hmm. further in the direction of uh, the Swiss uh, system. Uh, there's an organization in Switzerland called Dignitas in mm -hmm. Zurich where uh, many Americans g go today even, I think 25 last year mm -hmm. went uh, to, to die because they were denied that opportunity here and they had to leave their families and travel mm -hmm. uh, across the ocean. Um, but uh, even, uh, I, I think the current bill is, is too restrictive, uh, six months is, is you can't really predict mm -hmm. at the very end, is it six months or four months or seven months? And uh, a year would be more uh, reasonable that, uh, because after all, it's the patients that's making the choice. Mm -hmm. And if someone has ALS, for instance, uh, they know what the progression is likely to be. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't have to go through that last year if they don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you mentioned the case of uh, withdrawing uh, food and uh, water from a patient which I know they, they do, and a member of my family had that done in, in New York, and it took her uh, about a week to die of uh, uh, lack of water. But mm -hmm. that sounds, uh, to me, it seems to me that's a comparable torture to uh, waterboarding. Uh, do we really know what kind of pain they, they suffer when they're, they're uh, getting hungry and they, there's nothing to eat and they're, they're unable, maybe they're in coma and they're unable to, to do anything about it? or they're getting thirsty and there's nothing to drink. And I, I don't think anyone should have to die that way either. No, and it was very, I thought it was cruel and it was, it was really devastating for me as, as a, you know, I think as a freshman in college or, I don't know, to sit there by my grandmother's side and this woman, this incredible woman that I had so much respect for and always made me laugh. And I, you know, and I had seen her progression. Um, I mean, this was a woman who had traveled the entire I mean, gone to the, through the Sahara Desert with her like, girlfriends at a time when women were not traveling, you know, around by themselves. Um, 
just an incredible person and this is this is her last week and a half of life and you know gasping and and dying of dehydration and you're right we had no idea um, and all I could do was sit there and hold her hand and and cry and hope that it happened soon um, but at that moment I vowed that <laughs> none of my family members or myself we will never be in this situation again and it's just it, it's it's awful for the family um, and it's awful for the patient and and it's just it's denying uh, what's really going on um, which is that this this person that we love is dying and we want to make them as comfortable as possible you mentioned that she had Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and that even the, the our current bill would not uh, cover people with mm -hmm. Alzheimer's uh, I, I will uh, if I'm elected I will try to adjust that bill so that it covers everybody and there aren't uh, there aren't people that fall through the cracks yeah I mean everyone has their uh, you know a different approach to this and I have this uh, as as a policymaker I have this strange mix of of having a very progressive vision um, which I think you know people recognize in me and then I'm incredibly pragmatic in terms of how we get to point A from point A to point B so what I'm focused on is getting this very reasonable bill passed um, and it's it's been held up for way too long um, and I think that um, you know for some people that oppose it or are scared of it we give them a you know we can help give them a chance to see it work and and see that the worst fears aren't going to come true um, because this is a a big cultural shift in this country too I mean that's you know there's a lot of ways in which uh, many countries in Europe are doing things here that are there that I wish we could do here I mean I think about maternity and paternity leave that's paid for a year or six months or a year I mean this is incredible and, they, and they're happy to pay taxes um, but we have a long way to go in this country culturally before we can get there you know it's not just the numbers it, it's cultural it's people's relationship to the government what they think their tax dollars should can and should go toward um, so in every baby you know sometimes it can be frustrated frustrating because it feels like we're making small steps when the problems are so big um, but but what we're doing as we pass each law as we make those steps is we're also changing the discussion in a really important important way and changing the way people think about uh, their neighbors about taxes about government about the public good and and all of that's going to put us in a much stronger position as we go forward to to change to change these laws in an even even bigger way I lived in Sweden for a while mm -hmm. for about a year or two and so I, I was exposed to those uh, maternity leaves the, the the father and the mother both get uh, maternity leave and the, the government actually pays people to have the children that mm -hmm. the you get extra money to cover your uh, yeah. child expenses I mean mm. I just that blows my mind I mean the, the start that that child would get being surrounded by their mother and father for six months or a year um, and they're the mother and father not being stressed about how to put food on the table or how to pay the mortgage I mean that is the best brightest most loving start I can think of for any child and again when we talk about long-term costs um, and benefits and payoffs this is to me it's a no-brainer um, and uh, and you know looking at some of these moms who have to put their their infants in daycare after five or six weeks I mean that is tough um, and it's tough to do the bonding and give and, and make sure that that child has a strong supported start in those situations um, so we can learn a lot of lessons <laughs> from our European counterparts but but one of the things I want to start with right away is sick days and even just mandatory maternity leave period <laughs> You know, when you think about it this way, we still have a long way to go. But, but again, I think the discussions are important, and having people in leadership that, that put this high on the priority list and see it for what it is. It's an investment in Vermont's future. It's an investment in our families. It's not a freebie. It's not a handout. It's not big government. You know, this is just common sense investment, um, and that's what we need to continue to talk about and move toward here in Vermont. On the subject of Europe, you mentioned that your family came from mm -hmm. Italy. Um, I, I was working with a group uh, here in Burlington uh, last year or the year before uh, called Viva, mm -hmm. uh, Vermont uh, Immigrant uh, Voting mm -hmm. Alliance. And um, uh, there was a, um, 
a professor from UVM mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, who had come here from Italy also, mm -hmm. and uh, we also had a, a member in the group that was uh, a professor from uh, Australia, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, they send their children to uh, to school here in uh, in Burlington, but they're not allowed to vote for the school board. But in Europe, uh, the uh, immigrants are allowed to vote in local elections, so they can vote for their school board and their the mayor of the city. They n they don't vote for the uh, the president of France, for instance, but uh, but they can vote uh, absentee for the president of their own country. But when you're living in a country, you're not allowed to vote absentee for the school board. So you should be able to vote absent or vote in person for the school board where you're living. Mm -hmm. And so we we're trying to change the the rule here in in Burlington. Um, there's some question that may need to go to the uh, state assembly too. Hmm. Um, but uh, what do you think about allowing immigrants to vote? I think it's a great idea because there some of these ideas that they have over in Europe, they need to bring, bring them over here. And, and if they could vote, they would, the ideas would start to percolate over here too. Well, uh, yeah, and I actually am glad, uh, thank you for bringing that up because I was not aware of that. Um, and I mean, to me, that's another no-brainer. I think it, I would certainly support that. Um, not only because those immigrants have kids in the schools and you know, they're, they're paying taxes too. I mean, they're paying into the school system. Mm -hmm. um, and so having a voice in that is, is incredibly important. And so whatever needs to happen, whether that it's some organizing at the local level or making sure that we, um, we change something at the, at the legislative level in Montpelier, I would certainly support that um, because uh, parental involvement in the school system in, in school boards and investments, local control is something I, I feel really strongly about and want to make sure that people's voices are well represented in, in that decision making process for sure. Another important issue um, in the legislature is uh, Vermont Yankee. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Um, <laughs> Um, I'm sure you could guess how I feel about that, and most of our viewers could guess. Um, I uh, obviously want to see Vermont Yankee retired. I think it's, you know, Entergy has, been, has proven itself unreliable um, as an operator of that plant. Uh, you know, the plant is, shouldn't be running, continuing to run, you know, past its original date of retirement. Um, I think how the court decision turned out is really unfortunate, and I support uh, Vermont's and uh, the Attorney General's continued efforts to uh, on that to appeal that uh, that court decision because again this was um, this process was something that Entergy agreed to um, at the outset and uh, and I don't think that the the judge made a fair assessment of, of the conversations or the intent behind the legislature's decision not to issue the certificate. Um, I also think that we really need to look at decommissioning funding. And this is where I would point out that there are big distinctions between myself and my opponent on this issue. Um, during my opponent's time in the Senate, he voted to keep Vermont Yankee open, and he also voted against holding Entergy responsible for decommissioning funding, which is a huge problem. Um, we have a lot of nuclear waste on our hands, and not only is this plant at this point going to you know, operate for another 20 years um, and produce, you know, another 20 years of waste, uh, but then, uh, you know, we're going to be stuck with a bill that just does not make sense. And so, um, on the on the side of keeping of, of whether Vermont Yankee is, continues to operate, there's not a lot that we can do in the legislature right now. We can continue the conversation on the ground, uh, but uh, I will be a part of an effort and, and want to help lead an effort on the on the decommissioning funding costs. Um, and and also, you know, some of the thing, the issues that we find ourselves in now with uh, some of the fees or taxes that we're trying to levy on Vermont Yankee, just to to bring them up to par with some of our other energy sources um, and use use that revenue to make investments and programs. I want to continue that work um, because, uh, you know, again, we're not we're not counting the long term costs of Yankee's continued operation and the waste in our state, and we need to do that. Um, and and I also believe strongly in moving toward a clean, renewable energy future here in Vermont, and will continue to lead on that discussion. Um, and uh, 
and that means a package of wind and solar, sustainable biomass, and those sort of things, that that's really a direction we need to head, at, head to in Vermont. Um, not only to impact climate change, to lead the country, but also to keep dollars at jobs of, at, around energy production in the state. I interviewed both uh, T.J. Donovan mm -hmm. and Ed Stanek uh, here uh, regarding the Attorney General's race. And one of the issues uh, there is that uh, Bill Sorrell mm -hmm. has, uh, has not been all that successful in prosecuting the cases uh, going up into the federal court system. And uh, the, uh, one of the problems that uh, TJ pointed out is that uh, uh, the uh, Bill tries to do it himself. And perhaps uh, he doesn't have enough money in, uh, in uh, the Attorney General's office to uh, hire uh, experienced uh, professionals in uh, litigating in front of the Supreme Court in Washington. And uh, if, if we had uh, the very best lawyers uh, arguing our case, uh, we, we could do better. Uh, so uh, if I'm elected to the Senate, I will uh, propose that uh, we, uh, we do something about that and we provide uh, money to uh, and perhaps require that Bill uh, employ uh, professional litigators in the Supreme Court to uh, defend our issue. It's, it's been very expensive for the state to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been paying millions of dollars in, uh, in the court costs of our opponents, and, uh, and we should be winning those cases. Um, well, there's a couple points that I would like to make. I mean, I think that, I think that the primary in the, uh, between TJ and Bill was incredibly important for the state. I think it brought up a lot of uh, important conversations about the role of the AG's office, about where we pull resources from, uh, how we focus on our time. And so I really applaud TJ for that and was supportive of really all of the issues that he raised and, and hope that he has a long future in politics here in Vermont because we need him. Um, on, uh, for Attorney General Bill Sorrell, I mean, he, I'm certainly supporting him. I, I want to see him continue to be Attorney General and uh, as opposed to, you know, his opponent. And he, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. So it's it's very, uh, it's a little bit easier for us on the sidelines to say, well, we should have done this or I would have done this. I mean, this is a very difficult case. Entergy has so has money, <laughs> you know, so much money, and so um, that's one of the challenges of the court system and hiring lawyers and going up against them. I mean, we're never going to outspend them on lawyers or resources or anything like that. Um, but I think what we realized after going through the court case is that outside expertise is needed, and if I, I believe that that's even something that uh, Attorney General Sorrell has expressed. And so I think it's clear to everyone as we move forward um, that we need some of that expertise from around the country. And, and you know, I, it will take some resources, but I'm also confident that there are a lot of attorneys in this country who are uh, leaders on this issue that see the importance of this case and the potential precedent that it could set and are going to want to be a part of that. Um, and so, you know, that's part of how we get really monumental things done in this country, is there are good people out there who are experts who want to be about the, you know, a part of the process uh, without bankrupting the state. So um, I, think, uh, I think it's clear to a lot of people across this country how important this case is and, um, and the ramifications of this going all the way to the Supreme Court and, and not not being ruled in our favor. I mean, that has implications for the entire country. So yeah. it's, a, it's a different ballgame as, as we move into s stage two of this. I, I like Bill Sorrell too, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm just concerned about some issues. So I was supporting TJ in the mm -hmm. primary. Um, first of all, because of the, uh, I would like to, uh, if I'm elected to the Senate, I will vote to uh, provide more money uh, to make it easier for Bill mm -hmm. to, uh, to litigate these cases. Um, but there's also the issue of uh, police brutality. Mm -hmm. uh, we had that coming up here in, in uh, Burlington. Mm -hmm. During the governor's conference, there were uh, mm -hmm. two demonstrators were shot. And uh, when TJ was here, we discussed the I case uh, in Brattleboro a few years ago. A man was uh, shot by the police in the middle of the Unitarian Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, Bill never, uh, never gave uh, an explanation of why those police officers were not prosecuted. And uh, it was his responsibility to, uh, to investigate that, uh, that shooting and decide on the prosecution of the officers. 
And it seemed clear to me that they, they should have been some uh, investigation of mm -hmm. that. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I think, you know, it's something that's certainly been in the news a great deal lately, um, not only because of the protests in Burlington, uh, also, you know, there's been another death, a uh, taser death. Uh, and so uh, these factors are very concerning to me. Um, and I certainly have an interest in making sure that we have independent investigations of these, uh, of these incidents. You know, I don't, I don't doubt uh, that, you know, I support our police officers. I think by and large they're in it because they, they care about Vermonters and they want to do the work and keep people safe. Um, when there are inc concerning incidences, like uh, the result in fatalities or undue injuries, we, those have to be in independently investigated. It's really important um, in maintaining trust between the police department and the Vermonters they serve, because if that starts to break down, um, that's problematic. And so, uh, so we need to see open books, open investigations of, of these things. And to the extent that um, Attorney General Bill Sorrell uh, you know, hasn't been a champion in that, it's not something I've been involved with, on, particularly over the years, but um, would like to know more about. And we need to do uh, everything that we can to make sure that those cases are fully investigated um, and go through due process, absolutely. The, uh, the police commission just met last week mm -hmm. um, here in Burlington, and uh, uh, there was also a meeting of the, uh, the city council. I spoke at both, uh, and there's a forum before the city council mm -hmm. and also before the police commission, and I spoke in both cases uh, uh, on behalf of the, uh, the uh, demonstrators. I, I wasn't there to see what happened at the demonstration. I was inside the, uh, the governor's conference uh, filming the, the whole conference. I put it on this, this show, the, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I saw the video afterwards and it seemed clear that, uh, uh, that uh, those people should not have been shot. Um, so but, uh, so I, I asked the, uh, uh, the uh, police commission to uh, further uh, do further investigation, um, but they, uh, they, uh, they seem not to, to inclined to do so. And, uh, but their approach is to uh, treat the police department as a whole. Um, and all they were talking about is uh, the policy of uh, what is to be done. And they, they, were, they didn't seem to be willing to identify the specific police officer, which I asked them to do. Uh, I, I think the, 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 these, uh, the police officers have paid very high salaries to take risks. And uh, they, they shouldn't just shoot first in case somebody might possibly you know, be a risk. Um, I think they include some bad eggs, and the the the, the, the uh, police tend to stick together as a union. And uh, I, I would have liked to. I asked the uh, police commission to find out who it was that did the shooting, and then uh, subject that individual to disciplinary uh, measures. Um, I was also disappointed when Ed Stanick was here that he he treated the police as a union, and uh, uh, all he could see is the the u police union there, and not individuals who, who, who should uphold the law and be bound by the law in the same way they expect uh, citizens to be bound by the law. Um, so uh, I, I hope that something can be done. And if I'm elected to the Senate, I will uh, definitely uh, interview, uh, introduce a bill to hold the police accountable in those situations. Well, when I think about that situation in particular, Again, for me, it goes back to the big picture, which is I always try to pull myself up out of a particular situation. And um, when I, well, I wasn't there, but I was on the campaign trail, God knows where, <laughs> but um, I did watch the video of the, of the altercation. And my immediate reaction was, uh, it, it just made me feel sick to my stomach seeing uh, a picture of a, of a police officer in full, you know, riot uniform pointing a gun at a protester. <laughs> um, and so, but I think, again, I try to remember people's humanity and what happens when you put people in a situation with a, the power dynamic such as this um, on, both, on both sides of the issue. So you, put, you take a, a group of peaceful protesters and you have police officers show up in riot gear with weapons and you know the, the plastic shields. And both the protesters and the police officers in that situation are geared up for a conflict because uh, be 
because it's a very clear power dynamic. And so what I would like to do, er, and what I think it would be, although I'm not a decision maker in Burlington, <laughs> but I think in the big picture that it's important to try and head off those situations before they even occur. So for me, that's um, maybe there's community safety patrol at the protests and they're not all, the police officers aren't in riot gear. Or if we know that there's people who are concerned about a particular issue like the tar sands pipeline and they don't feel heard and they're worried about the decisions that they feel may or may not be made behind closed doors without their involvement, um, let's head that off by having a public forum ahead of the governor's conference, you know, where state leaders are in there and listening to sharing their, their um, their opinions and their plans for energy production or for you know economic uh, cooperation between uh, the U.S. and Canada and some of the other states in New England and hearing hear from Vermonters, so that there is a chance for people to feel heard. And you know it's been so important to me in my work on the ground and my work in the state house um, to make sure that Vermonters have a voice in the process and they feel heard. And I think a lot of times when we see violence erupt, it's it's because of a fundamental frustration that things, you know, you see something happening or you disagree with something, you're concerned about the direction that our state or our country is going, and you have no say in it. It's beyond your control. And again, I think that is the culture surrounding people's ability to weigh in, um, to be a part of, of, of some of these demonstrations. Um, we need to approach it in a supportive way instead of a combative way. And so in that sense, you know, it's hard for me to, you know, the, an individual police officer, I mean, you see this group think and, you know, mob mentality when people are in those situations where there's a, there's a lot of fear. So, you know, what I try to do is think about from the individual uh, how these things can unfold. Um, and, and if the situation wasn't, you know, riot gear and protester, you know, that police officer may have reacted very differently. Um, so I want to figure out how we head that off uh, in the future. Like you, I wasn't there. I was inside uh, filming the governor's conference, and I wasn't even um, uh, uh, very sympathetic to the protesters. I, I actually disagreed with them. Uh, that uh, from being inside at the conference, uh, I, I thought the, uh, the uh, participants were addressing the issue very constructively. Mm -hmm. They were talking about uh, electric cars and, and how to um, provide uh, fuel for the electric cars and, and uh, use of windmill energy to mm -hmm. uh, power our cars instead of gasoline. And this was really what they should have been doing. And, and th what the protesters were doing was not all that constructive. But on the other hand, uh, I, I don't want to see someone injured. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I saw that video, uh, I don't know if you saw the same video, but uh, the, the protester, I think it was Jonathan, was running or walking away. Mm -hmm. And the officer actually was following him and leveled his rifle at him and, and shot him in the back as he was walking away. And it, it seems that I, I can't see any possible uh, excuse for that. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that the mindset you have is is really important and appropriate in this situation and we again should make for make sure that these incidences are are investigated independently um, you know not only for the the safety of the people who are involved and accountability in the officer but for the larger relationship between Vermonters and and their police officers uh, we need that relationship to be strong and trustworthy. My last show here was with uh, Jill Kruinski. Mm -hmm. She's running for, um, she's, uh, she was chosen by Peter Shumlin to fill a vacancy mm -hmm. in the state assembly. And she's running for re-election now. And, um, and she's uh, uh, um, one of the officials at Planned Parenthood. Um, I, I'm supporting her, uh, even though she's a Democrat and I'm a progressive. Uh, I, I believe it's important, uh, what she's doing is important, and uh, I, I think Planned Parenthood, uh, we need more uh, supporters of Planned Parenthood in mm -hmm. the assembly. Um, how do you feel about uh, abortion, the issues of abortion? Uh, suppose uh, if Romney were to win and he appointed another justice on the Supreme Court, uh, abortion could suddenly become illegal. 
what would we do in Vermont then? Um, well, there, first of all, I, I, Joel Korinsky, I have so much respect for her, and I've had the pleasure to work with her in the State House uh, to consider her a friend, to work with her on reproductive health issues in the state, and um, I am a huge supporter of her and believe that she does great work for Vermont, and, and I'm really, really hopeful that we'll have her back in the State House because um, I think a lot of people recognize that, so I agree with you on that. Um, uh, the second thing about choice is, you know, again, I there's no ambiguity at all in where I stand on choice. And I was just actually, you know, endorsed uh, last week by the Planned Parenthood Action Fund for, for the work that I've done around women's health and women's right to choose and the values that I stand for and will bring to the office of lieutenant governor. Um, and it's true. I mean, Vermont is, is a pro-choice state. Actually, most of the country is supro supportive of choice. But clearly, we can't take anything for granted because despite the the popularity and the court-affirmed right uh, to to confer to a woman's privacy and control over her, over her reproductive uh, health and decision making, there are uh, leaders out there from you know anti-choice leaders, uh, legislators from the extreme right that are trying to do everything they can to roll back uh, a woman's right to choose in this country and and roll back. I mean, turn back the clock to not even provide access to contraception. I mean, it's kind of mind-blowing <laughs> when you think about uh, the effort to put us, set us back 50, 60, 70 years in this country. Um, so we can't take anything for granted. And what I've, what I've noticed a lot about what's going on in the country is that instead of just having the conversation about overturning Roe v. Wade, there's really a concerted effort to introduce really thousands of laws across the country that uh, pick away at a woman's right to choose. Uh, the idea being that if you can, you pick away at it, uh, an individual law sounds innocuous, but the end game here is to set precedents, is to shift um, uh, choice to a decision of the state instead of a decision at the, at the federal level, um, and, and to really do all of it without, you know, under the radar screen. Because if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned tomorrow or attempted to be overturned tomorrow, I really think women in this country would be in the street. Um, but you pick away at it, issue by issue, tiny bill by tiny bill, and before we, you know, we don't even notice it, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, our rights have been rolled back 60, 70 years. And um, what I really want Vermonters to remember, there's a, a very important distinction here between myself and my opponent on choice. Um, my, uh, my opponent says he's pro-choice, but has a four-point platform that would introduce four different laws uh, that would restrict a woman's right to choose here in Vermont. And it's really important that Vermonters know that. And these restrictions are right out of the playbook of, of the national anti-choice groups. So it's um, a fetal homicide law, partial birth abortion ban, parental notification, and a prohibition on federal funding for abortion services. So in my mind, this question of where does our current Lieutenant Governor stand on Planned Parenthood funding and funding for abortion services is a critical question um, that needs to be asked. Uh, so, you know, what I stand for is clear. It's, it's uh, a woman's right to have control over her body and her reproductive health, uh, uh, access of women in this state to preventative and wellness services through Planned Parenthood. Um, and it's really holding our ground, you know, not, not allowing, not going backwards. Um, and that's a big distinction between between my opponent and I, and uh, and I will do everything I can as lieutenant governor to to fight for what women have and and really grow our options instead of restricting them. When Jill was here, she also talked about paid sick days. Mm -hmm. um, how, uh, how do you feel about uh, legislating paid sick days for people? Well, actually, I think Jill and I and and some other legislators are are cooking up some ideas right now about mm -hmm. what we could do. Um, and one of the things I'm hoping to do uh, in October as a part of my, as a part of the campaign is to really release a, a full campaign platform on, uh, on protecting working families and a package of legislation that we can stand together and proudly introduce in 2013, um, even regardless of the outcome of my election. I really want to move this legislation forward and um, I would, 
love to work with Jill and see paid sick days be a part of that, maternity leave be a part of that. Um, you know, again, expanding access to affordable childcare um, and early childhood education needs to be a part of that. Uh, so we're in we're in the the planning process and the research process, and and I hope to be able to make that announcement in in uh, in, co uh, in partnership with state leaders um, and key legislators in the House and the Senate uh, in mid October. Uh, when we were talking about uh, paid sick days, when I was talking with Jill about it. I pointed out that uh, during the 1980s, I had lived in, in France and when Mitterrand was president. And uh, they, they were legislating all sorts of uh, uh, eco economic uh, measures, for instance, the 35-hour week and mm -hmm. uh, paid vacation, six weeks mm -hmm. of paid vacation every year. I, I would like to see some of that brought into uh, Vermont. And uh, uh, our unions have been come, uh, uh, only about 15% of the po uh, workforce is unionized now. And so the unions aren't able to protect the workers. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I I the government should step in and provide some protection there. So I, I not only agree that we need sick days, but I, I suggest to, to, to Jill that uh, we should also provide other safeguards. Mm -hmm. For instance, the, uh, the work week, 35 hours, anything over 35 hours is double time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, perhaps a vacation, too. Yes, um, I think. Uh, you know, these are all things that we want to continue to work toward. Um, you know, the paid sick days bill, I mean, those things have been sitting on the wall in the legislature year after year. So, you know, my, one of the opportunities I think we have is to, um, is to put some of these bills together that have been sitting on the walls individually and, and frame them around what the, the goal of them really is, and that's to support working families. Um, and, and paid sick days are an essential an essential piece of that, um, and and I think that starting there is really important. Well, uh, we're running out of time. Um, do you have a website that where people can go to uh, find out more about your campaign? I do, and actually, it's uh, it's a brand new version of the website is launching today. So by the time this this airs, it'll be uh, brand new. So it's www.geekus. 2012.com. So my last name, G-E-K-A-S, 2012.com. So uh, on there, there's a blog from the campaign. You can sign up for e-alerts, uh, make financial contributions online, sign up to volunteer online, um, and you'll see all of the, the my stance on, uh, on all the different platform issues. Um, and we also have a Facebook page, which uh, is Geekus 2012 again. Um, and uh, you can follow a lot of what we're doing on there as well. And uh, Twitter hashtag Geekus2012, so you see the theme going here. Mm -hmm. And you can get to all of those, uh, you know, they're all linked to each other, so you can get to them by going to the Facebook page or the website first. Um, and, you know, I would just, I want to say thank you so much for having me on here. This was a great discussion, and I really appreciate, you know, the ability to spend a uh, a significant chunk of time getting to introduce myself to Vermonters and talking through some of the really important issues because on the campaign trail sometimes I feel like we're all blocked into you know 30 second bullet points um, and so you know I appreciate the opportunity to to give voters more detail about who I am and what I stand for um, and you know to all the Vermonters who are watching you know, thank you for being a part of this um, thank you for going to the polls in November, and and I hope this is you know just the start of a long conversation of a lot of work that we're going to do together to make Vermont a you know better, stronger, more prosperous place. Um, and and I, I want to hear your thoughts. Please please stay in touch on the campaign trail, and I and I really hope to have your vote in November. Well, thank you, Cass. I'm thank glad you. we could do this. And uh, thank you very you much. You can count on my support. Thank you very much. And for the viewers at home. Uh, I hope you come back next month for another issue of uh, Vermont Today. Thank you for tuning in.